And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of The Hand of Votar. Uncle Simeon, are you all right? He's dead. What? He's dead. I went out to make a telephone call. There's no extension in here, you know. I was dialing the number when I thought I heard Simeon say something. And then I heard him scream. I ran back in here and found him like this. Look. Where? At his throat. There are five red marks on his throat, like finger marks. Just as if, as if he'd been choked to death by a person using only one hand. The Hall of Fantasy will present the Hand of Botar in just a moment. And now for our story entitled The Hand of Botar. Even after he was dead, the spirit of Simeon Botar remained with those who had known him. His personality was so strong that when he entered a room, all eyes were immediately drawn to him. But there was something strange about Simeon, something different that set him apart from other men. It couldn't be defined, but it was there just the same. And when he said, Even when I die, the world will not forgive me. I'll make sure of that. Even if I have to return from death. I first met Simeon Botar several months ago. Eric Matro had insisted that I meet him, and so one evening we drove out to his small estate several miles from town. You like Simeon, Charles. He's a very interesting person. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. The way you talk about him, he seems to be an idol of yours. Well, hardly that. It's just that I find him stimulating. And when I told him that you played a wonderful game of chess, he insisted that I bring you out. He's a chess player, eh? Oh, yes, yes, a very fine one. When you play with him tonight, you'll be treated to a very unusual experience. How do you mean? You'll see for yourself. You know, Charles, there's something odd about Simeon. I can't place it myself. Maybe you'll be able to help me. Something odd about him? Yes, and even though he's so interesting a person, there's something about him that frightens me. Almost as if there was an air of death about him. Especially about that hand of his. I didn't know whether Eric was trying to play some kind of a joke on me or not. I had no time to think about it, however, as in a minute we turned off the highway onto the gravel road leading up to the house. The door of Botar's house was opened for us by a very beautiful young woman. Oh, it's so good to see you, Eric. Thank you, Marcia. My good friend, Charles Brakeley. Marcia Jameson, Simeon's niece. A pleasure. Won't you come in? Where is Simeon, Marcia? He's in the living room waiting for you. I understand you're quite a chess player, Mr. Brakeley. Well, not a very good one, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, on the contrary. Eric says that you're an excellent player. And Uncle Simeon is most anxious to meet you. It's right in here. Simeon, say we're here. Oh, so good of you to come, Eric. Uh, is I take it as Mr. Brakeley? Yes. Well, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. Would you gentlemen care for a drink? Oh, none for me, thank uh, you. The usual for me. Marsha, will you prepare a drink for Eric? Yes, Uncle Simeon. You, uh... Hey, chess, eh, Mr. Brakeley? Yes. And sit down, please. As you can see, I already have prepared the board to play. Seeing you're my guest, uh, you may have the white, Mr. Brakeley. Oh, thank you. Uh, would you put on the blindfold for me, Eric? Oh, of course, of course. Tighten up, Simeon? Yes. Can't see a thing. Thank you, Eric. I hope you don't expect... Not at all, Mr. To... Brakeley. Not at all. Here's your drink, Eric. Thank you. Are you, uh, ready, Mr. Brakely? Do you, uh, want me to call out my moves to you? Oh, no, that, uh, won't be necessary. Well, then, uh, how do you know what move I make? Well, my hand will know. Proceed, Mr. Brakely. You have the opening move. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. King's Pawn to King Four, Mr. Brakeley. Good safe opening. I'll counter with the same move. Now, your move, Mr. Brakeley. King's Knight to King's Bishop, Mr. Brakeley. Let's say I'll bring my queen out thusly. Mr. Botar, uh, how do you know what moves I make? You can't see the board through that blindfold, can you? Of course not, Mr. Brakeley. My hand tells me. Your what? My hand. You notice how the fingers are drumming now, Mr. Brakeley? Yes. But my brain is not controlling those fingers, Mr. Brakeley. The hand is an entity unto itself. Are you serious? Of course I am. How else would I know your moves? I cannot see you, Mr. Brakeley. Neither my niece nor Mr. Patrol have told me what moves you've made. How else would I know? Let us proceed, Mr. Brakeley. It's your move, I believe. The game continued. It was incredible. The fingers of his hand would be silent as he moved, but when it was my turn, he would place his hand on the table and the fingers would begin drumming slowly. As I made my move, the tempo of those beating fingers would increase and then stop as Botar made his move. Your move, Mr. Brakeley. Check, Mr. Brakeley. Check. Check. Check and mate. You play a very good game, Mr. Brakeley. I'll take this blindfold off now. Well, now, tell me the truth, Mr. Botar. How did you know my moves? Well, I've told you the truth. Well, you don't mean to say... That's exactly that... what I mean to say. My right hand has developed to such an extent that I believe it has, well, almost an intelligence of its own. That's impossible. Not necessarily. If we lose the use of one hand, we learn to do things with the other that require two hands before. A blind man learns to make his other senses perform some of the duties of his eyes. It's not impossible. The hand does seem to have an intelligence of its own. It has a strange grayish cast to it, Simeon, as if it were dead. Get me a pin, Marsha. Yes, Simeon. What are you going to do? Strange thing, Eric. There's no feeling left in that hand. I'll show you what I mean. What are you going to do? Prove to you that I feel no pain if the hand itself is injured. Here's the pin, Simeon. Thank you. Now, watch me. There. <laughs> It's in my hand, and yet I feel nothing. Either you're telling the truth, or you've learned to control your reaction to pain. It's the truth, believe me. I'll take it out now. There. You see? I had no feeling whatsoever of pain. Well, that's strange. What? My hand is moving, and I'm not... Oh, oh, oh. Simeon, get it away from your throat! I can't move it. Do something. Do something before it kills him. <laughs> We'll return to the tale of The Hand of Botar in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of The Hand of Botar. Eric Matro and I have driven out to the home of Simeon Botar. I had been a witness and participant in the most bizarre exhibition I had ever seen. And then, after the game was over, when Botar was showing us that his hand had no feeling in it, the hand suddenly moved to his throat and began choking him. Do something before it kills him. Help me. I'll get it. I can't move it, Charlie. Let me help you. Starting to... Simeon, are are you all right? Yes, I I guess so. Oh, what happened, Botar? I I don't know. I, I can't explain it. All of a sudden... It's in my throat, choking me. You're all right now? Yes. I lost control of my hand at that moment, gentlemen. I couldn't move it away from my throat. But now... Uh, now I can move it at will. Have you thought of seeing a psychiatrist, Mr. Botar? No. Why do you ask that? Well, you've heard of schizophrenia. A split personality, haven't you? Naturally. But let me tell you right now, Mr. Brakeley... 
I am not suffering from schizophrenia. Well, that's the only rational explanation for what just happened. I don't think so. Do you mean to say that you really think that hand has an intelligence of its own? Yes, I do. Then you'd better be careful, Mr. Botar. If what you believe is true, then that hand could very well kill you. We left shortly after that. As we drove into the city, my mind wouldn't forget the image of what had occurred that night. Eric. Yeah? Uh, how well do you know Simeon Botar? Oh, pretty well. Uh, do you think he's all right? If you're referring to his mental condition, I'd stake my life on it. When I took psych in college, we studied split personality and some of the strange courses it takes. Automatic writing, for example. Mm -hmm. The victim claims his hand wrote a certain message that he himself didn't. But actually, he was the victim of schizophrenia, split personality, and his other self wrote the message. Now, that's what could be wrong with Botar. How do you explain the game of chess, then, Charles? He couldn't see anything, I know. I moved my cigarette close to his face while the game was going on. He didn't draw back even a fraction of an inch. Well, that's true, but I, I still can't believe it. You remember how the fingers drummed on the table prior to each of his moves and during each of yours? And then, just before it happened, remember how they began drumming on the table? When that happens, I have the feeling that the hand is thinking. Then you believe it. That it has an intelligence of its own. Yes. I'm afraid I do. In the weeks that followed, I saw a great deal of Marsha Jameson. I saw Simeon very rarely, going out of my way to avoid him. I didn't believe what he had told me, but he made me feel uncomfortable, and there was something about him that frightened me. One night, Marsha and I had returned from a play downtown. We stood outside the house saying goodnight, and I noticed Eric's car in the driveway. I had a wonderful evening, Charles. Ah, so did I. Oh, Eric must be here. There's his car. I didn't notice it before. Well, neither did I. It's in the uh, shadows by the side of the house. Charles. Yes? I'm... I'm getting worried about Uncle Simeon. Why? He's frightened. He, he doesn't sleep at night anymore. What's bothering him? The hand. He says that he can't go to sleep anymore without without fearing what it will do to him. The only time he's he's rested is when he's had one of the servants tie down the hand so so it can't move. I think he should see a doctor. But that's what I thought too, but he won't. I don't know why. What's that? A scream from inside the house. Let's go. Uncle Simeon! Mr. Botar! Eric! Oh, is that you? Yes! Where's Simeon? Come into the library, hurry! What's the matter? Look. Uncle Simeon! Are, are you all right? He's dead. What? He's dead. I went out to make a telephone call. There's no extension in here, you know. I was dialing the number when I thought I heard Simeon say something, and then I heard him scream. I ran back in here, and I found him like this. Look. Where? At his neck. There are five red marks on his throat, like finger marks. Just as if he'd been choked to death by a person using only one hand. We called a doctor, and he in turn summoned the police. They questioned us closely, and when Eric told them the story about the hand, they laughed at him. The final verdict was death by strangulation killer unknown. Three days later, he was buried. Eric and I returned to the house with Marcia after the funeral. Marcia had taken the funeral very badly, and we sent her up to take a nap for a few hours. I'll get it. Hello? May I speak to Miss Jameson, please? Oh, she's resting now. I don't want to disturb her. I see. It was a rather irregular request that we received, but uh, we did, as the note said. I just wanted to tell her that the package is being dispatched and will reach her today. Who's calling? Uh, Mr. Erskine. Goodbye. Huh. Erskine. Now, from where do I know that name? He was a mortician. Oh, yes. What do you want? 
Oh, he said something about a package being delivered here today. Hmm. I wonder what it is. I don't know. Well, I'll tell Marsha about it when she wakes up. It's strange that he didn't mention what was in it. Well, the package will arrive today. Then we'll know what's in it. I'll get it. Hello. This is Eskin again. I'm afraid I can't do what the note said. The thing is... Hello? Hello? Mr. Erskine, are you still there? What's the matter? I don't know. He... He sounded like he was choking. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon. Marcia was still asleep. The sky was heavily overcast, and I knew that we were due for a bad storm shortly. Eric and I heard the front door chimes ring, and a few seconds later the maid ushered in a man we had seen before, the lieutenant of detectives who had been at the house after Simeon Botar had died. What can we do for you, Lieutenant? I don't like to trouble you, Mr. Brakeley, uh, especially today, but uh, I'm afraid I have to. What's the matter, Lieutenant? Do you know uh, Mr. Erskine? Yes, he handled things for Marsh. That's right. Uh, well, he's dead. Dead? Yeah. Well, he um, he called here on the phone. Uh, he started to choke. He choked all right. He was uh, strangled. What? That's right. Uh, and he has the same marks on his neck that uh, Mr. Botar had that night. Five little red marks, like the finger marks of a hand. You are listening to the tale of The Hand of Botar on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled, The Hand of Botar. We had come back from the funeral with Marcia Jameson. She was upstairs getting some rest. A few minutes before, Lieutenant Hillman of the police had come out to the house. I learned then the reason Erskine had seemed to be choking when I talked to him on the telephone. That's right, five little red marks, like the finger marks on a hand. It's starting to rain. Yeah, we're in for a bad storm. Erskine didn't have any enemies. He was uh, preparing a package to send out here, and then he was killed. Who did it? Not who, Lieutenant what? Uh, how's that? I believe it was Botar's hand that killed Erskine. What are you talking about? Botar's dead. But his hand isn't. But Simeon's been buried, Eric. I don't care. I think it was... Her. <laughs> that was Marsha. Come on. Marsha! Marsha, what's the matter? Is he up there alone? Yes. Marsha! I, I, I saw it. I... I saw it. Saw what, Marsha? I, I was I was half asleep. I felt that something was in the room with me. I, I looked up. The window was slightly ajar. And then, ah, on the floor, I, I saw it creeping along. What was it you saw? Uncle Simeon's hand. What? That's right. Let's take a look. Are you sure? Do you know what you're saying? Of course I do. You, you'll see for yourself. There doesn't seem to be anything in here. Maybe, maybe it went back out the window. Lieutenant, take a look at this. What? Look, on the windowsill here, little scratches as if they were made by fingernails. You don't expect me to believe I didn't believe it either, Lieutenant, but now I do. Botar's hand has an intelligence of its own. I believe that both Botar and Erskine were killed by that hand. I think you're crazy. And I think I can prove it to you. How? Lieutenant? Get an order to give us permission to exhume Botar's body. Then you can see for yourself. Just a little more now. This had better be more than a wild goose chase. I think that's enough. We're, we're going to open it now, Marsha. All right. Uh, let's get this outside casing yeah, top off. There you go. Forget it now. <laughs> That's it. Now, let's get this casket open. There he is, Lieutenant. That's Simeon. Look, Lieutenant. His right hand is missing. Now, will you believe us? That thing is alive, and it's back there at the house. It's evil and malevolent. We have to go back and destroy it. We searched the whole house, and we still can't find it. Maybe it left the house. I don't think it has. I think it's hiding. 
me? I don't know. How did the hand ever get When Erskine called me on the phone, he said something about an unusual request written in Simeon Botar's hand and that he was sending the package here. While he was preparing that package, the hand killed him. That thing is somewhere in or around this house. I, I have a feeling that... Oh! What was that? Sounded like a window breaking. Where? Upstairs. Let's take a look. We'll break up into two groups. Mr. Michaud and Mr. Breaker will go together. I'll keep Miss Jameson with me, all right? All right. Oh, fine. Let's go then. I have the only gun. If you see it, call for it. All right. Stay behind me, Miss Jameson. I'll be right, right, right behind you. You take the front part, and we'll take the rear. Fine. If you see it, don't forget to call. Let's go. Why don't we try Simeon's bedroom? That sounds like a good idea. Come on. Remember, that thing can hide almost anywhere. I know. We might as well... Look. The bottom left pane of the French door leading to the sun porch, it's broken. Then, then the hand is, is in here somewhere. We can't be sure. It might have found entrance this way, but... Listen. It, it's in here, all right. Lieutenant, it's in here. Here, right there. Eric. Stand over there by the broken pane there. Make sure it can't get out. Right, right. Oh, well, where is it? How oh, we know it's in here somewhere. Come in quickly. Let's get that door closed. Right. Now, be quiet. There it is again. Where, where is it coming from? Be quiet. It's moving. Can't see it. Neither can I. Look out, Charles, in back of you! It's climbing up the floor in back of you! Where? It's making for the light switch! But the lights are out! Be quiet! Ah. It's dropped down to the floor again. I can't see a thing in the dark. It's going after someone in this room. Hear it moving. Be quiet. I can feel something on my back. I can... Ah! The hands are under control. Get the hand away from her. Right. Uh, hurry. Hurry. Yeah, we're doing our best. A little bit more. A little bit more. Turn. Throw it on the floor. Shoot it. It'll get away. Hurry, Lieutenant. Hurry. It's making for the French door. It's horrible. Believe this. Nor would I. I'm still afraid of it, even though I I know it's dead. I'll make sure that it's destroyed once and for all. Oh, I'll never forget the sight of it, creeping across the floor like some crawling monster. Characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs>